was that was too cool. Yeah, we uh, that we beat the crap out of that mind player. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I was like, I was willing to die because that's you know that's how I roll. My wisdom six. I'm committed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Just so you guys know, I won't be able to see you because there's like the lights are like directly in my eyes. <laughs> so it's like well, that doesn't even make it better. Okay. You know it's funny. So yesterday I was in a panel in one of the smaller rooms, or not smaller rooms, but like one of the medium rooms over here, and we packed it, and and, and uh, it was just totally full. And so today I get the giant room, and there's like so, just sparse. <laughs> That's the nature of the beast. All right, so we're gonna get we gotta get started. Is it is it time to start? Okay. All right, guys, welcome out. Uh, I'm Larry Korea. Um, I'm not gonna waste a lot of time on introductions. Uh, I'll just say that I, I do a lot of stuff on audiobooks. Um, and a few years ago, one of the VPs at Audible actually had to do a presentation for authors about how to write for audiobook, and he asked me to write up some advice for it. So apparently I'm pretty good at this stuff. Uh, I do sell a lot of audio. Um, you know, I've won a bunch of Audi Awards too, which the Audis are like the, the Oscars for um, audiobooks. So I, I, I like audio. It's a great part of my business. And so I'm going to try to give you guys some nuts and bolts advice about how to maximize your writing for audio. Uh, and then I'll take as many questions as we can. I know you guys will have a bunch of them. Okay, so... Can everybody hear me back there? You guys good? Okay, good to go. All right, cool. All right, so guys, writing audio, um, you need to think of it as it's the same thing as your book, but it's also a separate art form, right? So you learn how to write books, and you learn how to get the presentation of the book down and how you present your dialogue and how you present your scenes. Um, but you got to understand the psychology of how the human brain processes the story, the difference between the two, the two methods of audio or uh, reading. One of the things you don't realize about your readers is your readers' brains will actually skim books. So there are certain things you can do in the written word and get away with that you cannot do in audio. Uh, the biggest, most obvious one is excess dialogue text. So you've always heard the old advice, and this has been around since uh, you know the 50s. They used to say, don't use um, don't use flowery dialogue tags. Everything should just, just only use said. He said, she said. Have you guys all heard that advice? Okay, that's crap advice for now. It is. It's it's, it's dated advice because when that advice was given, and I think it was actually Elmore Leonard's one of, one of Elmore Leonard's Ten Commandments of Writing, but he wrote that back when audiobooks were just a tiny niche market, and if you wanted to you know do audio, it was like 26 cassette tapes. All right, for, for, for a book. And so I want you guys to listen to, I, I don't want to name any, I don't want to bag on any other authors, but if you listen to certain books on audio, and it's he said, she said, Bob said, he said, she said, he said, guess what that does? It hammers the reader in the ear. Because what happens is as you read the book, said becomes invisible. Your subconscious just sees it, skims it, that tells you who is speaking at the time, and you're good to go. In audio, however, your brain can't skim because that information is being delivered to it deliberately over time. So you don't tune out every time he says, said, 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 said. So there are certain audiobooks out there that, like I said, I don't want to bag on them, but if you listen to them, guys, it's just painful. Um, and so what, it, what you need to do first and foremost is vary up your dialogue text. Also, you'll discover that really they're extraneous. If you're writing good dialogue and you're writing clear scenes where it's not boring or confusing, the reader can usually tell who's, who's talking. Um, to, so to give you an idea, when I first started out, I followed the original advice about he said, she said. My first novel, I used the word said 800 times. I did a you know find and replace at the end. And I used 800 times in my, mo in my first, first book. My most recent novel, I think it was 180, OK? So I chopped the vast, vast majority of those out. Because one of the things that helps me as a writer is I go listen to my audiobooks of the previous books in the series before I write the next book in the series, right? So the stuff that you guys can do to avoid this is make your scenes clear, make your character voices distinct. So this is not just for uh, audio, but this will help you guys, period. It will help you write better dialogue. Also then, sometimes, you know, it's easy 
because you have like just two people. If you have Bob and Sally are talking in a scene and there's only two back and forth, that's really easy. You don't need to have a lot of dialogue tags to know who's talking to who. But let's say you have a meeting and there's six or eight people in a meeting having a conversation. And if you don't have dialogue tags in there, it's going to get really confusing, right? And what are the two ultimate sins you must avoid as a writer? Never be boring, never be confusing. Okay? So, if I have a scene with a whole bunch of people having a conversation, I'm going to vary this up. And there's nothing wrong with said. I can use said once in a while. Like I said, 180 times in a book instead of 800. What I'm going to do is I'm going to establish it. So Sally is going to, before she delivers her dialogue, I'm going to have Sally do some action. Okay, Sally poured herself a cup of water. Blah, 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 blah. Well, there you go. I clearly established that this paragraph is about Sally because Sally just did an action. Or I will have dialogue where Sally is talking, and then Sally leaned back in her chair. Then Sally says something else. All of a sudden, now, I never, I didn't have a dialogue at all, but I interrupted dialogue with action, and it's very clear who is saying what. Okay? And once again, you can still use said, just don't overuse it. Um, in fact, so somebody yesterday on my fan page put up an excerpt from a, from a, from a book, and I, some of you on the fan page saw this, and you're laughing. I can't name the author because I try not to trash this guy. You know, I can't stand him. <laughs> um, but he used said like six times in, in literally six lines. And I was like, okay, that's, that's not going to work. Now, how you guys can test this yourselves and see if your stuff works or not is I want you to read your drafts out loud. This sounds crazy, but it works. Because what happens is, once again, keep in mind, you write the same way people read and that your subconscious is going to skim. It's kind of like when you edit a book and you get done edit, or you get done writing the book. If you edit it immediately, you're going to miss stuff because your subconscious thinks you did it. It's not actually there, but you think it's there. That's why you should take a little break, clear your head, and then edit. It's the same thing with this. So you read out loud, and that enables you to hear those hitches and those screw-ups and those little things that you would not realize you were, you were, they were in there, okay? So read your books out loud. It sounds nuts. Your family's going to think you're crazy. If you don't have your own office and you're like writing at the kitchen table still, it really gets weird. <laughs> uh, I, I get it all. I, I, you can ask my wife. I talk to myself in my office all the time, and it's, it's me narrating. So do that, uh, and it doesn't have to be good. <laughs> you're not a professional narrator. Okay. Now, another thing I want you guys to be real careful for is stuff like patois, regional dialects, okay? Because this is stuff that if you write it and you really, really accentuate that weirdness of the language, that can become very, very difficult for a narrator to translate in a way. And it's also it's difficult to read, too. So usually what I'll do is I'll describe the accent, and I'll change some words, but I'm not going to write it perfectly realistically to how humans would actually deliver that speech in real life because that's really difficult to, to process. Um, on that, oh, I just did a perfect one there. Um, if you write perfectly realistic dialogue like human beings actually talk, it reads horrible. It's terrible. If you actually just do a real life transcript of how people converse, you get a lot of, um, well, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 the thing with the, you know, um, the thing, man, right? <laughs> that is super, super annoying. So don't put that in your books unless it serves a purpose. The one time it serves a purpose is like, say I want to say that the character is hesitant. I want to I display that this character is having a hard time finding his words. Like, that's part of the scene. Then I will put, um. Then I'll put the, uh, uh, and the stutters and, the, and that kind of thing. But if you just deliver it like people normally talk, it's horrible. If they, you ever see a transcript of a political, like, off-the-stump speech, so it's not a, you know, prepared teleprompter speech, but just somebody talking off the stump, and they do a pure 100% accurate transcript, it is painful to read. So... Don't do that. Another thing, after you read the books out loud, don't be afraid to vary up the voices for yourself because that's going to help you come up with better, stronger, more distinct characters. It's going to sound silly, um, 
but okay, so I can't really see the back of the room because of the lights, but we've got a lot of role-playing games because here we're a bunch of writers. Okay, so okay, so three quarters of the room plays role-playing games. All right, <laughs> so that's what we were doing last night. We were playing D and D. That skill there, where you play a character, actually will help you a lot writing for audiobooks. Believe it or not. So as you're reading this for yourself, don't be afraid to get into character. That will help you deliver more dialogue and help you deliver more realistic dialogue for that character. Because if you're one of those writers that struggles with dialogue, it's uh, like every character sounds the same. Have you guys ever read a book where every character had the exact same sense of humor? It's weird, isn't it? Because that's not how real life is at all. And it feels false to the reader. So by giving them different voices, you guys are doing this, it's going to help you. It's going to help you make it stronger, all right? And also, the more you differ differentiate that stuff, the more it's going to make it so the narrator can differentiate it. I know I screw up every now and then because I'll be listening to one of my old audio books, right? And to, to get into the mode of the new ones, and I'll be listening to it, and I'll have like a, several lines of dialogue, and then the narrator will use the wrong voice, and that the narrator will read it in Bob's voice instead of Sally's voice. And what that tells me is that I, as the writer, screwed up. Because I did not put enough clues there for the narrator to know that it was the right person. And I've actually had a couple of those in books where the narrator did that. But it actually worked perfect because it was the kind of line that could have been delivered by either character. And so in that case, I just pretend I didn't screw up. I meant to do that. That was Bob's line all along. <laughs> okay? Um, and on that note, so if you guys are traditionally published, you're not going to have a lot of say on who your narrators are. Those narrators are going to get assigned to you by the publisher. So your publisher is going to, you know, you're going to get uh, uh, something at Audible or Brilliance or Podium and um, Blackstone. And you're going to be there, and they're going to do, um, they're going to assign a narrator to you. That is good or bad, it's going to be kind of a crapshoot. I got lucky. I got fantastic narrators. I got guys like, you know, Bronson Pinchot, Ollie Wyman, Tim Gerard Reynolds, uh, Adam Baldwin. I got amazing narrators, right? They're super good narrators. So if you guys are on that, it's kind of a crapshoot when they're first assigned. And sometimes you get a narrator that's not a good fit for your book. It is what it is. You make the best of that. Now, if you guys are indie, you're hiring your own, all right? That is you need to actually make sure you talk to that person and make sure that they are a good fit for your book, personality-wise. Because there are some truly good books out there that have bad, bad narration. Terrible narration that just do, doesn't fit. Or even sometimes it's a narrator that's a good narrator on other books, just not for this particular book. So you got to make sure that if you are hiring a narrator yourself, make sure you get someone who fits. And uh, like a good buddy of mine, his book... It's a great book. I love his book, but I can't listen to his audiobook because the audiobook narrator is just awful. But I've listened to the same audiobook narrator on other books, and they're fine. So it's all of its fit. Um, and also, you pay for quality narrators because some people are, you know, they, they like Bronson Pin Show don't come cheap. <laughs> all right? He's one of the most popular audiobook narrators for a reason, so the guy is in demand. Now, when you do that, though, you can make their jobs easy. Keep in mind there are certain things you're going to want to communicate to your narrator, especially like if you were writing technical stuff and there are certain words pronounced a certain way. Uh, if you were writing anything that's got a lot of foreign words, um, I do gun stuff, right? I write a lot of action adventure, so I got a lot of gun stuff. Uh, Bronson Pinchot, wonderful narrator, but he's doing hard magic for me. Uh, he talked about the 3006 rifle. The 3006. Okay, every gun nut in the room is like, what? It's 30 ought 6 But you would not know it's 30 ought 6 because we don't write out the word ought, A-U-G-H-T. We just put 06. So that's one that he didn't know. And he just read it and didn't think of it. Now, sometimes I'll have my narrators will contact me beforehand, and they'll be very specific. They'll be like, I've read the book. I have a list of questions. How do I pronounce the following things? And then you work through it with them because uh, none of my narrators are – giant gun nut. Well, Adam Baldwin is a giant nut. Gun, gun nut. Yeah, I didn't need to tell him anything about gun related. <laughs> but it was a science fiction story, so it didn't matter anyway. So make sure you give those kind of pronunciation guides. Uh, like when I do Son of the Black Sword, uh, everything is Indian. All the names are Indian subcontinent kind of thing. And the narrator is asking me, how do I pronounce this? How do I pronounce that? Uh, and I was like, a lot of them was like, I don't know because 
I would leave it up to him because the way the words were spelled and how an English language audience would pronounce that word was not at all how it would be pronounced in uh, native tongue, right? So on the narrator, I was like, use your judgment, you know, because uh, all the words are different. So make sure you have like kind of a, a style guide for your narrator if you are working with your narrator. And most professional narrators are going to read the manuscript and they're going to talk to the author and get some questions and you're going to help them out and get them kind of on the right track. Okay? One of the things I want to talk about too is pacing for audiobooks. When I say pacing, I've, I've talked about this uh, yesterday. If anybody was on my action panel, I talked about, you know, taking the tension up, taking the tension down, taking the tension up, taking the tension down. You don't want to keep it all in the same plane because then that becomes the norm. Like, if it's just action, 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 the action has now become the norm. The reader is now bored by action. Where do you go from there? So you've got to vary it. Now, audio, this matters a lot, too, in timing. Timing doesn't matter as much in a physical book because people are going to read at different speeds. And they actually do read faster when they're in an excited part audiobook it's still being delivered to you at a deliberate pace so you need to watch out for scenes that run too long that's one that'll really get you so if I can listen to my audiobooks now of books I wrote when I was younger and I was a newer writer you know 25 books ago right and I'll listen to it and I'm like okay I should have cut this scene here but the scene actually runs for three more minutes of audible narration but the vibe is I should have stuck, if I stopped it here, it would have been much stronger. So how do you learn about the pacing of your scenes and when to cut them? Uh, this is a practice thing, guys. There's not really a rule of thumb because some scenes need to go longer. Some scenes need to be shorter. This is something you're just going to learn as you go. But by listening to your own audio, it will make you better at that concept of pacing. The main thing is you don't ever want to drag something out in audible or in audio. Um, there's a thing where human brains start to skim in a book, like we get to a boring part, and it's an info dumpy kind of thing, or it's characters we don't care about. We'll, 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 we'll kind of keep skimming because we want to get to the next part, right? That, that's normal, because like say there is a character you really do care about, and then you're going to keep going. Audio, you don't get that automatic brain skim thing. That person now has to sit the next 10 minutes of their commute listening to this thing that they hate. <laughs> All right? Now you've just given them a bad experience, and they're not going to buy any more of your books. So you got to kind of, like, pay attention to that. Make sure you kind of get that set up. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. I can't really see the audience, but I did see some people starting to do this. <laughs> so uh, on, on time-wise, I think we're good. So if anybody would like to, there's a microphone over here. If you want to ask any questions, just go ahead and start lining up. I will keep rambling because I can ramble for hours. Uh, okay, so go ahead. Hey, Larry, it's Mike. Oh, it's Mike. Hey, Mike. <laughs> Question on narrators that switch between sexes in the characters. Uh, is your opinion you're better off just keeping a fairly neutral tone, like some narrators do, or trying to affect um, the, op the, the perceived tone of the opposite gender, like a male narrator may raise his voice up and talk like that, or and the reverse is true. Yeah, that's going to depend greatly upon the narrator. Um, so, I have had where I've had a series where it's primarily a male point of view for a protagonist, like Monster Hunter. Ollie Wyman is the narrator for all but one book of that series, because in one book I have a female main point of view protagonist character, and we switch to. And so the decision we made at Audible, like I talked to the Audible people like that, and they said, okay, let's get a female narrator for this one. Um, Actually, that's one of my worst-selling audiobooks of all time. It's a, the book that has still done fine, but what happened is everybody in the series is super used to Oliver Wyman being the narrator, and so we have one book with Bailey Carr as the narrator, and it just—it was different enough, and her pronunciation of certain names and places and accents was different enough than Oliver that it, a lot of the longtime fans it kind of upset them. Um, it's, I think she did a fine job. I think she did a great job, and she did uh, her own book. But that's one of those things you just got to kind of watch for. And it's going to depend on the narrator, too. Like, Bronson Pinchot does female voices all day long. There's two styles of narration, too. And keep in mind, when you, especially if you guys are hiring your own narrators, some narrators do what I like to think of as kind of a dramatic reading, right? So they just read, and they have, like, kind of gravitas to it. 
Like Tim Gerard Reynolds, that's what he does, right? So when he does Son of the Black Sword, it's an epic fantasy series. It fits perfect. Like Bronson Pinchot is a one-man audio play. So if there's 60 characters in this book, he's going to have 60 different voices. And every scene is going to be narrated based upon the point of view protagonist. This is why he wins the Audi every year, every year for best narrator, right? So it's going to depend. So when you're picking them, keep that in mind, the style you're doing. Like if I'm doing epic fantasy, Son of the Black Sword, then that gravitas narration works fantastic. Um, if you're doing a big epic sci-fi, uh, that kind of thing works fantastic. Um, it just depends. But I'm doing Tom Stranger, a comedy series. <laughs> Gravitas presentation for Tom Stranger ain't going to work. I mean, we have little stories. that We have chapters called Apocalypse Cow. You can't have Apocalypse Cow with serious narration, right? It's got to be goofy. It's got to be fun, right, in character. So just... That's, that's, that's how I would look at it. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to that. I think it's going to depend on your work and the narrator that you're going to hire. So, okay, go ahead. Hi, Larry. Oh, Casey. It's Casey. Hey, Casey. Um, so you mentioned uh, substituting essentially action beats for dialogue tags to keep track of who is whom in a dialogue scene. One of the things that I find myself doing a fair amount of the time is actually discussing the quality of the character's voice in order to indicate, like, an emotional state. For example... You know, uh, her. Uh, you she know, whispers. She yeah. She well, shouted. not so much she whispered, but like you know, her her voice her voice deepened an octave as she got intense. Her voice cracked. Yes. Yeah. My it, question is, in audio, the narrator is going to do that. Yes. So should, ha, sh, sh, if if the narrator then reads the dialogue with a crack in the voice, they don't then need to say her voice cracked. Yeah. How do I reconcile that if I'm working? She, Should I have them remove that tag? No, that's an interesting one, and that's a fine line to walk because actually I didn't mention this when I was talking about the different dialogue tags, but I like using all those ones that for the longest time in English class they told us not to use. Whispered, shouted, admitted, questioned, uh, you know, so on and so forth, that kind of thing. A lot of them, though, if, the narr if it's clear to the narrator the nature of the sentence being said, like say it's an action scene, everybody's very excited, or they're scared. Let's say they're scared. You don't need to say, she said fearfully, if you conveyed that fear. And this is the kind of thing that you'll get by reading it out loud. Sometimes you do need to have that in there, though, because there might not be anything else in the scene that says her voice is quavering, or her voice cracked. Um, you need to convey that somehow to the narrator. I've actually done where I've cheated, um, where I've actually talked to the narrator on the side, and I've had where it's been something that's not explicitly stated in the scene, but the narrator actually put that in the scene. Does it make sense? I think so. Thank you. Okay. Um, but I am a big fan. I am actually a big fan of all those other ones. But once again, don't fall in the trap of just replacing said with other words, because then you're doing the same thing as you do word before. Well, it's not as annoying, because, you know, repetitive word usage is boring. People get bored if you use the same words over and over again. We're, we're writers, guys. Synonyms are our friends. <laughs> Don't be afraid of them. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, Jeff, go ahead. Hey, Larry, apparently it's no Larry Ask Questions Day. Uh, so going back to the traditional publishing part that you uh, mentioned, is it possible as a new writer or as someone who's approaching traditional publishing to get narrated approval in your contract or are contracts just not negotiable anymore? Um, I actually don't know. I, that's a question between you and your publisher. I'm actually not sure on that. Then probably not. Because normally what happens is if you're, if you're selling the audio rights with your, with your physical book rights and your e-book rights to a traditional publishing house, they don't necessarily produce the audiobook themselves. They are then going to sell that audiobook to uh, Audible or, or whoever to produce it. So probably not because you'd have that step in between. Now, if you, may, if you retain the audio rights and you negotiate that yourself with the Audible or Blackstone or whatever, um, then I'm sure you could specify that. But it would depend on your relationship with them and how much they want your book. I found usually... Like at this point in my career, I actually have input. Um, so they'll come to me and they'll be like, okay, we have the following narrators we think would be a good fit for this book, so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so. Here are samples of their work and why we think they'd be a good fit for your book. 
of these three or four guys, who do you think is the best fit for this book? I do that now, um, but I've never had like a con- well. I, I take it back. I have had one contract specifically where we specified who the narrator was going to be, but that's because we did it in advance, and that was part of the deal. It was, uh, Tom Stranger with Adam Baldwin, and that was like because we that was part of the fun was I made the narrator a character in the book. Uh, so the actor was actually the president of the United States in this alternate dimension. So that was weird. That's a, that's a goofy one that I wouldn't judge that according to any other contracts. Um, yeah, so probably not unless you're selling it directly to the to the audiobook publisher yourself. So go ahead. So what you said about, like, reading certain lines of dialogue or story to yourself um, – out loud what about when you're in the process of like creating dialogue like w- what about the method of like uh, creating the conversation and then looking at that conversation and maybe reciting that conversation with different uh, different uh, different paths to that I, conversation to create I think it's dialogue. a good idea so uh, you can either do it in the editing process or in the writing creating process depending on how your brain works and how you come up with those stories uh, or how you come up with that dialogue I, I, I know people who do both I tend to do it in the edit thing so for me personally like I'll write it first and then I'll go back and read it all but there'll be other times where I'm struggling like say I have like a like a soliloquy okay so there's a monologue or somebody's giving a speech in the book or a presentation right so I, I want a certain kind of pitch so a lot of times as I write it I will say it out loud uh, as I'm actually writing it because you'll find guys that stuff will sound hollow to the ear it will just sound hollow to you like somebody would not say this this way it just doesn't feel right um, sometimes it's a little, and I, I just did it there in my own in my own speaking when I said wouldn't, didn't, shouldn't. Contractions are a big one. A lot of times when we're writing a formula, uh, uh, something that's supposed to be like f- um, serious, we think that they'd use less contractions. But really, people they don't, <laughs> and they still use them. And you'll catch that as you read it. So my first book, I did not. <laughs> sorry, I'm doing it now. My first book, I didn't read it out loud. I didn't have this trick back then. I never listened to any audiobooks before I wrote my first book. Uh, I used almost no contractions. Why did I not use any contractions? Because I didn't know any better. I was a noob, right? I was a new writer. Now I go back and I listen to that first audiobook, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. I could have did this so much better if I had read that out loud. But I just didn't catch it at the time. So I, I, hope, that, I, mean, I hope that answers your question. I don't really know if there's a right way or a wrong way to do it, I just find, and I'm not saying that you sh- you have to read your books out loud. Uh, the, the, everything I'm telling you guys is a suggestion, okay? There's no rules to writing other than make it not suck, <laughs> okay? So do whatever you need to do to make it sound good to you. Whatever trick that is, whatever part of the process it is, that's, what, that's, that's how you're going to do it. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, please. Hi, um so I self-published my ebook and print book, but I got approached by a friend who started a small press company, and he wants to do an audio book of my book. Mm-hmm. Any advice of like what I negotiate, royalties, my rights? Oh. Mm. I actually don't. I that's a that's a business question. I don't really have a good answer for you on that because it's going to depend a lot on the company. Mm-hmm. Um, because obviously if it's a small startup kind of thing, my big question to them is like, what are you actually going to do for me that I couldn't do for myself? Um, what level of distribution are you going to get me? Is this going to be readily available? Can people just buy this? And you know, what are you doing for me marketing-wise? What are you doing to push this? I mean, obviously you're getting a, a percentage. You know, what was the percentage you're going to get? Mm-hmm. I mean, you got to hammer all that out, and you're going to have to do your research on that and find some peers. Mm-hmm. They're kind of in the same boat as you. Cause I can't really tell you because like, like the deal that I get from Audible for an Audible exclusive is not the deal that a regular person is going to get starting out. Because I've, sure. I've done this so much. I mean, I've been the number one bestseller on Audible. So when they give me a deal, they give me like a good deal, right? Yeah. So I, I actually don't know. So I would, at a thing like this where you got all these other peers, yeah. seek out the people who are kind of at your level and have that same kind of deal and be like, okay, what did you get you know, on the down low? <laughs> Obviously. Yeah. You know, what, what, what kind of, what do you got in your contract mm-hmm. and, and see what they get. 
So, like, I, I can't even tell you what my last contract was because you guys wouldn't believe me. It was so friggin' sweet. You could ask my wife. I threw her, like, a party. <laughs> it was pretty nuts. Lost Planet Homicide on Audible, by the way. It's Space Bosch. Super badass. Love that one. Best I've ever been paid per word. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Okay, Larry. In uh, Tom Stranger, you have a manatee as a speaking character. So what was your conversation like with your narrator on how to speak manatee? And more generally, how do you approach, uh, there's things you can do in print with alien races and languages, how do you approach that from the audio point of view? That's a good question. Okay, so when you have like really weird things, like a man, the way I wrote the manatees, because real life manatees don't make noise, but the way I wrote manatees in this book, they're, they're a space-faring, time-traveling, ultra, super powerful, uh, you know, force to be reckoned with. Also, they're very fiscally responsible. <laughs> Actually, the manatees are extremely libertarian, and they also love to blow stuff up. They're very, their manatees are huge gun nuts. They float around in their par power armor. Very silly. Um, so what I, okay, so what I did on that one is I actually told the narrator, uh, you know, in a side conversation to me how they sound and how my fans made the jokes, um, and Adam Baldwin just ran with it. So I got a guy, an actor who's worked with Stanley Kubrick making hoon noises, and it's like, woo, you know, that's how the manatees talk in the universe, and, uh, he goes to cons now, like he'll do these cons and he'll have like a thousand people in a room and always somebody will be like, would you hoon for us is one of the questions and then he'll make manatee noises and 90% of the audience has no idea what's going on. Um, so in stuff like that, weird particular things like that, what I did is I would talk to the audiobook people, the producer first, I'd be like, I would like to do this kind of sound effect and I've done sound effects in certain things, usually comedy. I want to do a sound effect here, can I do that? They're like, yeah, sure. Then I'll put a note in the in the manuscript that he's reading. I, in fact, in Tom Stranger, true story, I have this little bit that says, insert dolphin noises here. Literally. And it was just like, you know, that do the dolphin jitter, 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 jitter noise, you know, that they, they make. And um, so we used the same dolphin noise three times in the story, and each time it meant wildly different dialogue in context. But I just, that's what I did. I was like, insert dolphin noises here. So if you're going to do something special like that, just make sure you talk to whoever's producing the audiobook in advance and the narrator so they know. That way the narrator just doesn't read insert dolphin noises here. <laughs> that said, when we did the print version, I literally left <laughs> insert dolphin noises here. Okay? So yeah, you can do stuff like that, but once again, it's going to go back to who's actually putting it together to make sure you guys are on the same page. That's just a communication issue. Oh, and as far as how you do alien languages and stuff, same kind of thing. Um, try not to make that kind of, especially like you get really weird. I've talked about this before about naming. I've, I've done talk about that. I, I do a podcast called Writer Dojo. So I do a writing advice podcast. Check it out. It's pretty cool. Uh, me and Steve Diamond, Writer Dojo. And we've done one about character names. We got into those, like, you get some of those books where they have like character names have like 26 letters and four apostrophes. Okay. A, your reader is going to skim those in print, and B, in audio, you're going to kill your friggin' narrator, and he's never going to pronounce it the same way twice, and your readers are going to get annoyed. So try to keep naming conventions that are memorable and usable. So, okay, go ahead. Hi, Larry. Would you please expand upon what points you would hit with a potential narrator to determine if they were going to be a good fit? The uh, biggest thing I would do, actually, is listen to uh, samples of their work. Um, go and find, buy some audiobooks, different audiobooks that they've done, or get samples and, and of stuff that's like similar genre to what you're trying to do, and see just how how does that narrator convey that? I mean, how how do they do? So, like when I got Tim Gerard Reynolds for um, Son of the Black Sword, they sent me uh, he had done the audiobook for Red Rising, and I listened to the audiobook for Red Rising, and it was it was excellent. And the tone and the vibe was such as like, yeah, that, that, that's, that's badass. Uh, when I did Lost Planet Homicide, they sent me a bunch of different narrators. And some of them had done cop, like, gritty cop show detective kind of stories, you know. I'm, and I'm writing Space Bosch. I, I, I looked at those like, okay, this is good, this is good, this is good. But I had one of them was Ollie Wyman who did all the Monster Hunter for me. And I love the guy. <laughs> and he's made me millions of dollars. <laughs> so I was like, I, got, I had to go with Ollie. You know, was that the right choice? I don't know, because it's still, the voices he do he does sound similar to the voices he does for Monster Hunter, which is my, you know, main series. And so was that a good strategic decision on my part? I don't know. Uh, but, you know, 
he does a great job either way. Should I have gone with a different narrator to, to kind of like expand that outward? Maybe. I don't know. But it's just one of those you just got to you gotta listen and then just kind of make a gut call. And, and he did a stupendous job. But would it have been a better story with a different narrator? I actually don't know. So it's one of those you just got to kind of like make the decision and go with it. Thank you. Hi. Um, so this isn't quite dialogue, but it's similar. Um, I usually write third person past, but I do a lot of um, thoughts, like characters. Internal, internal thought dialogue. You know? Yeah, and usually I indicate that with um, italics. Mm -hmm. Uh, and sometimes it's like I this or that, but sometimes it's just a sing like a sentence fragment. How do you make like how do you do that for audio? Well, you know the same thing. It's actually because when you put that word there in italics and it's clearly uh, you know on the page that this is internal thought. And I, I use that all the time. I love that. I, I I do that all the time. I try not to do big blocks of it. I usually do like one or two lines at a time. Um, the narrator knows what that's for. And the narrator, oh, cool. And the narrator is going to deliver that that internal monologue based upon that. Now, the one thing you need to kind of keep in mind, though, is you're going to have a point of view character. So basically, everything in that scene is going to be through that character's perspective anyway. So the only time you're really doing that is when it's like a specific line of like internal dialogue, right? But the narrator, a good narrator, is going to pick up on that and they're going to deliver it. Uh, in a way that it's in, in context in their head. Now, if you're looking at it on the page and when you read it out loud, it's impossible to tell that that's internal. That's when you need to put something like they thought <laughs> or, or she thought to herself. Or, you know, sometimes in paper that's extraneous, but it's just like a, it's just like a necessary dialogue tag for spoken words. So, but if you read it and it's clear that they're not saying that out loud, awesome, run with it. The narrator will just read it and the audience will, won't, they won't be confused. If when you read it out loud, it's like, mm, did she say that out loud? If it's something that she clearly wouldn't and uh, then it's clear to the reader or listener, then you're good. If not, put some sort of specification that it's in her head. Thanks. Hi. Um, I've written nonfiction. I'm a rookie on the fiction, so I've got a logistical rookie question, and that's uh, I'm reading third person protagonist point of view, mm -hmm. but when you're outside of their realm talking about other characters in the setting where the protagonist is not there, how do I handle that? Um, okay, I'm trying to understand the question. So, you, so, so you normally write nonfiction, is what? You yes, I've written nonfiction. So, okay. I'm just thinking logistically. So when you're writing fiction, like like so you're doing a third person perspective and you're switching you're switching point of view characters between scenes? Well it'll be third person omniscient how oh. I'm telling the story. Okay, third person omniscient is a whole big ball of wax. Okay. Um it almost it's super hard to pull off. Okay, so like everybody in here is a writer, right? So third third person omniscient rarely works. Okay. Um, for, for regular fiction, I, it's difficult. It's difficult. And you tend to get only, like, really skilled craftsmen can pull it off. Mm -hmm. And if you're at that level and, you know, you can do a third-person omniscient thing, then by all means do it. But for most people, it's really difficult to tell a story that way. What's uh, more practical? Uh, third-person limited in that, like, or actually I'm a first-person and a third-person guy. I've written probably a dozen books each. I like them both for different reasons. They both got their pros and cons. First person, I can tell a more immediate story. I can get more into that one guy's head and really develop one character and kind of get that vibe for one character. Third person, I can tell a bigger story because each scene I can go, I can switch to whichever perspective is the most interesting, right? Uh, omnis problem with third person omniscient is, is where it's all knowing, all seeing God narrator. Mm -hmm. um, it's easier for the way people read books to put themselves in the head of one character in one perspective rather than the head of an all-seeing, all-knowing uh, master of the universe. Um, like I said, I mean, Dune, obviously, it can be done rather successfully, but also it would be really super hard for you guys to sell Dune to an editor right now, right? It was a different world in the 1960s and what people expected in stories. So third-person omniscient can be done, but it is definitely a challenge. Uh, from an audible... Audio book perspective, 
it's also going to be that's when you're going to need a really good narrator and how they're going to convey the story, especially if you're head hopping. Because that's one problem with third person omniscience; they tend to head hop. Because like they'll look at, like like if I'm narrating this for third person omniscience, I'd be like I could look at the room and tell you the thoughts in every single person's head in one scene, mm. which gets confusing unless you're got a masterful touch. Okay, it sounds like it's I, I'm only in notes outline phase so i'm not stuck on anything it sounds like third person uh limited would be more practical yeah so best way to do if you're starting out what i recommend there is go and write one scene in both ways take a scene write it third person limited take the same scene write it third person omniscient see what you get and 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 see what honestly most people can't pull off pull it off in a in a in a novel length and make it actually work i've done it in short fiction whole novel of it i would die <laughs> what's abstract to me is it's the protagonist's point of view but when he's not in the scene like that's where i get kind of confused. what i would do then is i actually the way i look at this and this is not just audio this is writing in general i'm gonna every time i switch a scene i'm gonna pick the best character for that scene if i'm writing a third person point of view novel i'm gonna have usually one or two main i'm gonna usually have one or two main narrators and i'm gonna have two or three secondary narrators and I might even have one or two scenes that are just from a tertiary narrator that we'll never see again like some dude who just dies okay I've written scenes where it's a dude you've never seen before but he's some guy and I just want to accentuate that something is big and dangerous and terrifying I'll have this one narrator for one scene and he dies at the end um, so I would just just do not don't don't okay like I said there's no rules of writing but this is a really powerful suggestion because you have to, you know, you, you got, it's really easy to screw this one up. <laughs> Don't jump narrator to narrator in the same scene. Stop the scene, then go to a new narrator. Okay? If you head hop in the same scene, nightmare. So bad to pull off. Can be done. I mean, there's some masters out there who can pull this off, but most of you guys ain't Dan Simmons. <laughs> no offense. You haven't been. Once you've been doing this for 50 years and you want to, like, I want to head hop in a scene. It's like, okay, you're Dan Simmons. Here's your, here's your royalty check full of money. You do whatever you want, sir. <laughs> you know, but One for the most of us, I wouldn't do that. That makes sense. Uh, separate issue more on dialogue. Um, how do you handle what's been your epiphanies or successes or failures on the whole? You're just switching, you know, quotes said this, quotes said that, but you're not. You're, there's no dialogue tags. You're just going back and forth for a while. Mm -hmm. How long can you let that last? Until it gets confusing. And that's that's the key, honestly. And this is one you're gonna you're gonna do where you're reading it out loud, and if you start to lose track, keep in mind, guys, you have an advantage as the writer in that you know more than the reader. So if you get confused, imagine where the poor reader is. If then the reader is like super screwed. So you can pull that back and forth, back and forth. And you can, as long as if they both have strong voices, you can do it. I did a twenty thousand word novella a little while ago. It's actually a lot, you know, because it was specifically for Audible. So Lost Planet Homicide is 20,000 word novella, and my goal was to not use a single dialogue tag. My goal in the whole novella was to not use the word said once. The editor made me put one in. <laughs> so, I mean, as honestly, the key is, is confusion. As honestly, as long as, you, as long as it's easy for your dumbest listener to track, you're okay. Um, keep in mind, though, in the... Um, you, 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 the goal is not to the goal is not to baffle the reader the goal is not to impress the reader the goal is to entertain the reader so we're not here to show our we're not here to show off how smart we are or hey I'm a writer I'm so clever okay writers who go into the attitude that I'm, I'm more clever than the audience usually don't do that good because they turn people off so your, your goal is to entertain and confusion is the opposite of entertaining Unless you're going for confusing, and then it's like part of the plot. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, you mentioned a manuscript that you gave the people to use. Is that different than the book? Um, no, usually, usually it's not. So normally, nowadays, we do um, with digital audio. We have a unabridged book. So whatever I sell to my publishing house, Bay and Books, that will appear on the shelves at Barnes and Noble is exactly the same word for word as the script read by the narrator. Uh, back in the olden days when we had to use CDs and cassette tapes for audiobooks, we would do uh, abridged. So you would actually have two separate versions. 
you would have like the real print version, and then you would have the abridged, shorter version that would go to the narration. Just, and that was just a logistical, technological limitation. Because the more tapes something was, the more it cost to do. Yeah. Hi. Um, this may show how dumb I am, but... <laughs> oh, no, no, don't feel bad. That's what we're all here for. We um, all started somewhere. I, you know, you referred to your narrator of the one book as a one-man um, play, or a digital play. And then you referred to, a, um, was a, oh gosh, now I forgot what it's called, a uh, dramatic reading. What is the difference between the two? Okay, the difference between that two, uh, when I say one-man play, it's like when Bronson Pinchot does it, every single character, he, he does every single scene as if he's an actor on a stage. So like he will deliver those lines with whatever passion that character fuels in that moment. He will change accents. He will change voices, um, and he's just—he's—he's—he's he's, he's a, he's a classically trained, you know, actor, and so he will deliver everything in that way. When I say narration, uh, um, they just read it. They read it, and they might change voices a little bit. They might do a few things, but they mostly just—they mostly just read. They're a reader, uh, and either one can work, just depending on what you're trying to accomplish. And we're out of time, guys. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry, because I, I could talk about this topic forever. There's a lot of stuff here. If you got any questions for me, I'll just catch me in the hall. Um, so I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll catch you all later. Mm -hmm.